So the initial question is, what is soil? You know, what is it made up of? Yeah. Uh, well, soil is really uh, probably best characterized as a as a living organism uh, with stru uh, structure. It um, has the elements that go into life. Uh, if you can remember the periodic chart from your chemistry classrooms that hung on the wall, and um, there are over 105, six elements on that chart, and in the roughly the upper third of that chart uh, are around 30 elements that go into life, whether it's an elephant or a whale or a human or a Holstein cow uh, or a sunflower or a wheat plant. There are those same elements. Um, <clears throat> four of those elements come out of the atmospheric commons, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and the rest of them are in the soil. Uh, so soil is a product of, um, of a three and a half billion year journey of life on Earth, and uh, in the that long journey of three and a half billion years, using those elements that go into life, nature's ecosystems uh, featured uh, perennials growing in mixtures. Uh, and so the problem of agriculture is that we reverse that uh, by featuring the annuals growing in the monocultures. The soil includes the microorganisms, it includes the invertebrates, it includes the minerals, and these minerals are cycled through these various life forms um, and are micromanagers of those elements that go into those of us that walk on the surface. Uh, so when we destroy that structure, we've destroyed the micromanagers and what we've done is come in as macro managers and we're not very good at it. And so that's what I would call the problem of agriculture uh, is that the ecological capital that sustains life has been getting eroded um, since, particularly since we started agriculture. So to, to press in, um, I wanted to, to get around this start for, for the layman. What is the best use or state of soil? Because I guess the question I'm trying to get at is, is it okay to grow stuff in soil? Oh. When is it the most healthy? When we just leave it alone? Or can we, can we work with it? Well, the, the healthiest state of soil uh, would be where uh, the life forms that have evolved together um, uh, within an ecosystem uh, have, in their co-evolution, have worked out the arrangements to efficiently use the sunlight that falls on the surface of the earth. In other words, let's say you have, and let me I give you two examples. If you're in, um, let's say, uh, Nebraska, um, and looking at a prairie, a never plowed native prairie, uh, and compare it to an adjacent wheat field. That never plowed native prairie is featuring perennials in mixtures, and that adjacent wheat field is featuring an annual monoculture. Uh, a man by the name of Null, a graduate student at the University of Nebraska back in around 1931 or two, made a comparison between those two systems and it happened to be the driest year on record and all the wheat plants died. But those prairie roots, that prairie system, managed the water, stored the water, and then allocated it to um, the new growth um, that would come up in subsequent years. All right, <clears throat> now here is an elegant management system in that particular part of the ecological mosaic of the planet. Contrast that, say, 
with a rainforest in Costa Rica where water is a nemesis to fertility and there the that rainforest like giant engines pushing that water back into the atmosphere so here you have two kinds of soils you got a tropical soil that is evolved with those tropical rainy conditions and you have the more dry land soil that has evolved so soil is not soil is not soil uh, and to quote Alexander Pope the poet uh, British poet in the epistle to Burlington he said consult the genius of the place in all well the genius in Nebraska is that prairie ecosystem in which the soils uh, have that whole system up below the surface has the ability to hold and then allocate water whereas the one in the tropics has the ability to receive that water but get rid of it fast so soil is more soils of the world are more diverse than the humans of the world in other words we've got to acknowledge the reality of the ecological mosaic and what it is that life is really about and after and what it's about and after are getting those elements those some 30 elements that go into life um, cycled through the whole system what the difference is between an annual and a perennial okay an annual plant is one that that germinates from seed grows and is dead within a year maybe within six months for instance the wheat plant from the time it germinates until the time of harvest is nine months the corn plant can be six months a perennial plant is one that just keeps coming up every year from the root or the rhizomes and um, uh, and is there year-round holding the soil we feature annual crops uh, for our food supply grown in monocultures all one kind uh, and nature tends to feature the perennials grown in mixtures so the annual uh, is a when, when we grow annuals out on the landscape we leave the landscape subject to the forces of wind and rain over long periods of time and that's how we have the soil erosion uh, that then has the consequences of that reduced fertility have to be offset by usually in industrial societies fossil fuel injections well, thank you we're gonna get back to that okay but I, that's great um, before we move on from just basic soil knowledge um, the other um, there's three little questions that you've already answered but I'm going to pose them to you and if you want to comment more you okay. can so it's you know why is soil important obviously but you might want to comment do you want to make a comment on well that? without soil we don't have life of, uh, of, of most of the life that we see around us without uh, the soil uh, we wouldn't have giraffes and without the soil we wouldn't have humans um, here's maybe I should say something to give a kind of a different perspective that is not common and is not common sense if we were to imagine ourselves small enough to go into a cell so small that we had to have binoculars to look around uh, we would see crystals say and we'd say they're not living we would see things that are wiggling around and we'd say ah oh, that's life but we come outside the cell and we look at the cell overall and we see the whole thing is alive just so with planet earth most of our problem with the planet is we have an inside out view but if we were to have an outside in view we would say see that there is an ecosphere and we would quit calling it a biosphere it's an ecosphere in which the relationship between the non-living world and what we perceive to be living world is really a um, really all one 
For instance, if there's an oxygen molecule out here and we say that's not alive, and then it's in our mouth, and then in our lungs, and it goes down into our toe and oxidizes the sugar, and then as a result of that oxidation coming out is carbon dioxide and water, where does the living, non-living, when, what is living and what is non-living? So if we begin to think about the living, non-living world altogether in an ecosphere in which they're embedded within ecosystems within the ecosphere, then we see that soil, to say that there is soil um, and to not acknowledge that it is a part of that total living, non-living interaction, uh, you know, is to kind of have a misapprehension. Um, and therefore, we end up treating soil like dirt. And that's a, that's a serious problem. Um, because if we say there is the non-living, <laughs> most people think of it as non-living, I suspect, um, then we treat it as loose stuff lying around that we can then play fast and loose with. Well, we can't afford to do that on planet Earth because 24% of the uh, land of the world is now allocated toward agriculture, toward the humans, you know, need to get food and, and fiber and so on. So um, uh, what I think we need to be thinking about all the time is the, um, um, well, what we need is the ecosystem as the conceptual tool for the management of our resources with soil uh, as the essential reality, essential component that um, is necessary for life. Well, a good soil is one in which the structure is in balance and in which the life forms called plants that stick up above the surface are able to capture the sunlight and harvest that sunlight by combining carbon dioxide and water. Uh, that's what's called by biologists as net primary production. If you have a poor soil, your net primary production is going to be compromised. Let me give this little story if we have the time. Um, go with me four hours by car north of San Francisco to Mendocino County. Uh, there in the Jug Handle State Park, I believe, there we find that the Pacific Plate is sliding under the Continental Plate and is pushing up. And as a result of that push up, the wave action creates little nicks, and those nicks translate into five terraces. Terrace one is 100,000 years old, and there we have redwood and dug fir. Terrace two, redwood, dug fir. Terrace three is a transition zone with some Jeffrey pine coming in. Terrace four and five is a pygmy forest. Now let's look at the dates. 100,000 years, 200,000 years, 300,000 years, 400,000 years, and 500,000. All right, if one were to weigh up within a square kilometer all of the above ground biomass, the redwood, dug fir, and whatever else, and compare it to, the, and say, in Terrace 2, and compare it to the weight in the pygmy forest, there's a lot more biomass in terrace this is one and two than there is in four and five. All right, you take soil probes starting in the fifth terrace going back toward the ocean uh, to the younger part, and sure enough, the nutrients that go into life, many of them have leached downward over that long period of time. So the availability of those nutrients translates into the uh, quantity of biomass on the surface. Now the reason I'm telling you this is 
that we humans would say the soils in terraces four and five are not as good as the soils in terraces one and two. See? Uh, however, it is over geologic time that this, uh, uh, this leaching has occurred. Now we ask the question, why are there not pygmy forests, pygmy prairies, pygmy whatever, all over the world? Well, geologic activity renews those nutrients, as with that, those continental plates, pushing up those nutrients, and, but it's, the leaching is in geologic time, the pushing up is in geologic time. Now when we humans come in that are not used to thinking in geologic time, or even human time, which is 150 to 200,000 years, uh, or even in agricultural time, which is 10,000 years, we, we do not appreciate the rate at, that we are eroding that ecological capital uh, of the soil. Well, let's look at, for instance, um, a country like Australia. Australia is a poor landscape and is going to remain poor because its last geologic activity was 65 million years ago. Uh, take California. The great central valley of California is rich because of the coastal plain, the coastal mountains, and the Sierra Nevada whose elements have gone down into the valley and supports this rich agricultural production. Or take now the upper Midwest above the Ohio River where the Pleistocene, the glaciers over 1.7 million years, gr years grinding those rocks and bathing those landscapes with these rich nutrients, those are very rich soils. Um, south of the Ohio, those soils aren't as good. They didn't have the benefit, benefit of the Pleistocene. They did have the benefit of the uplift of the Appalachians. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this is humans through agriculture are eroding, especially on the sloping ground in, in industrial time, what it took to build up in terms of ecological capital uh, in geologic time. So from the point of view of those of us that are involved in agriculture that need to have that food, we have to acknowledge that soil is as much of a non-renewable resource as oil. And in western Iowa, for instance, 18 tons of soil loss per acre. There have been times in the Palouse in eastern Washington with all that hill country where there are where they grow mostly wheat, uh, there's been as much as 200 tons of soil loss per acre. So the point is that the practices of till agriculture featuring the annuals is eroding that ecological capital, that uh, capital that is as much, for all practical purposes, a uh, non-renewable resource as oil. So in the long run, soil is more important than oil. So the question really is, again, and this is kind of a 101 type of question, which is what is agriculture? I mean, yeah. you, so we can frame this part of our film. Yeah. And then it goes into what's the history of agriculture and the agricultural revolution, like what was that? Yeah, okay. Well, agriculture represents the human's way of interceding uh, within a natural ecosystem and becoming a participant in the creation. Um, if we look at the way the planet was over those millions of years, uh, nature featuring the perennials in mixtures and agriculture came along and started featuring annuals in monoculture for the grains. Now there is agriculture that has to do with grazing, there is agriculture that has to do with tree crops, there's agriculture that has to do with vegetables and vegetable gardens, but we need to acknowledge that some 64% of the agricultural landscape of the planet is devoted to the annual grains, 
Humans are primarily grass seed eaters. Our number one grass is rice. Number two grass is wheat. The number three grass is corn. That's one, two, three. Those are the top three crops of the planet. Number four is potatoes. Then we get more into grasses and legumes again. So agriculture, those, all those crops are annual crops. And so when we think of solving the 10,000 year old problem of agriculture, we've got to think about the calories, the crops that feed us. And um, so what the human does in going into a landscape in where there's all that natural biodiversity of the soil and disturb that soil in the interest of putting in one crop, we have eliminated the elegant micromanagement and have taken on the gross macromanagement and we're poor at it. Historically, we're, we've been poor at it. Now we've been able to get away with it in certain places. For instance, the Nile Valley. The Nile Valley uh, has sponsored the oldest continuing civilization on the planet. And why is it able to do that? Why is it that we can have till agriculture there and get away with it? Well, let's look at what has gone into making the Nile Valley. The mountains of Ethiopia, where the monsoons come in, chip those nutrients off and send them down, for, that's where the headwaters of the Blue Nile are, send them down to meet the White Nile carrying the elements from the steamy jungles of Africa. And I like to say that the mountains of Ethiopia and the steamy jungles of Africa built the pyramids using humans as agents. So because of the flooding in the Nile yearly, um, that civilization has been allowed to persist. But go to civilizations that have had to depend primarily upon their hills. There, it's a battle to keep those elements from rushing seaward those elements that go into life, that go into human life, and <clears throat> the lives of our livestock, as well as the lives of our plants, to rush uh, toward the sea. So <clears throat> when uh, these atoms that are loose in the biota, rather than cycling, um, head seaward, that is a sign that we're losing the ecological capital and agriculture of the till variety uh, is, um, uh, is, is a way of burning our options for future generations. The plow has probably destroyed more options for future generations than the sword. Okay, so why, yeah, why did we go the annual route? Why do we go the annual route? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a very good and very important question. Um, <clears throat> agriculture had its beginning in the eastern part of the Mediterranean about 10 to 11,000 years ago. Um, and probably somewhere in the Zagros Mountains of western Iran. Uh, in that area, it happens to be the end of the Pleistocene, and that part of the Middle East is drying out. And <clears throat> in disturbed environments, say around campfires, uh, or where it's dried out, the annual crops, the annual seeds of the annual grasses um, um, spilling out onto the landscape. And I can imagine humans going out and gathering them and then beating them out into something um, and then eating them. Those were the annuals. They, I can imagine them doing that too with the perennials, but with the perennials, they weren't planting them back. They took care of themselves. So the human unwittingly got involved in unwittingly <laughs> domestication because those first few cuts of selection were tilting the annuals toward higher production. 
the perennials were taking care of themselves. All right, now that's in <clears throat> the Middle East. Over in China, uh, in the extreme end of this drying out place, rice, what I was describing there was wheat, but rice some eight to 9,000 years ago. Uh, probably something similar. And then in Middle America, um, corn, some five to six or seven thousand, we're somewhat uncertain on that, uh, is where the number three crop of the planet had its origin. And out of those grains, the grain agriculture <clears throat> of the Middle East, Mesopotamia, uh, and then the grain agriculture of China and the grain agriculture out of the Middle America. When you have grains, you have, if you, if you don't leave it out in the weather, you have something which can be stored. It's not like a root crop that'll rot. Once you have the ability to store these grains, you now have the potential to make it over a winter. Imagine hunters and gatherers, and let's say it had been particularly dry, and the hunters and gatherers, primarily it should be said gatherers and hunters, picking the berry or the grain or the bear or the rabbit or whatever, their food supply was somewhat less assured. But now we have these calories available and fewer babies are gonna die, the population can grow, and of course, it's the grains that sponsored civilization. Uh, so, uh, but to come back to the, the question, um, it had to do with the fact that we had to plant back the annuals, and as we did it, we became plant breeders. How does all that food get there? Can you name and describe the system that we currently live in that supplies our food? And of course, what are the cornerstones of the system? What are the basic operating principles? Okay. Uh, well, that too is a question that um, is, um, is very important. Uh, the cornerstones. If we were to eliminate from use, all coal, all oil, and all natural gas, the cornerstones of that system would be gone. Let me provide a little background. I'm in my 70th year, and in my lifetime, 97% of all the oil ever burned has been burned. If a person is 48 years old, 90% of all the oil ever burned has been burned. And if a person is 23 years old, it's half. So we live in the most unusual period in the history of the planet in terms of a species getting access to energy-rich carbon. Our food system is dependent upon that energy-rich carbon. And I want to give now, one other little sort of sidebar on all this. It's not a little one, it's a big one. The most important invention of the 20th century happened in 1909 when two Germans, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, invented the Haber-Bosch process. That's a process where atmospheric nitrogen can be turned into ammonia. 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, but it's di-nitrogen, N2, and that's a very strong bond, very hard to break. But by using natural gas, primarily, as the feedstock, atmospheric nitrogen can be turned into ammonia, and that ammonia can then be used as a fertilizer, and that fertilizer makes has given us, along with the plant breeding, a doubling in the food supply in a 40-year period, about the same length of time that the human population has doubled. 
If it weren't for the Haber-Bosch process, 40% of humanity wouldn't be here now. So what we have done is become good alchemists. The ability to take fossil carbon and turn it into human biomass, and we have used the supermarket, the transportation system, uh, to make that happen. Some years ago at least, 16.5% of the uh, oil um, of, uh, going in through the American culture uh, was allocated toward the food supply. Uh, one-tenth of that 16.5% was for transportation. So that's about 1.6. 25% was for processing. 25% of that 16 was for processing. Another 25% of that 16.5% was in the kitchen. All right, so if we had not had that, we would not be transporting food all the way across the country or from around the world and we would not have had the mechanism uh, in the form of the supermarket, the major growers and so on. It simply could not have been done using contemporary sunlight. So the cornerstones of this system that we have are all resting upon non-renewable, energy-rich carbon we call fossil fuels. What is the system doing to biodiversity? Well, uh, what's the system doing to biodiversity? They're taking down natural ecosystems in Brazil in order to plant monocultures of soybeans. Agriculture has a long history of encroaching on the wild. It had to, necessarily so. But now with the standing crop of humans somewhere hovering close to six and a half billion, we have a very serious problem to deal with. Number one, the wild biodiversity of the planet represents real economies, whether you're talking about a tropical rainforest or a prairie or an alpine meadow or an eastern deciduous forest, those are real economies. They feature material recycling and they run on contemporary sunlight. Agriculture encroaching on those real economies, nicking away at them, um, is as a threat to the biodiversity, what we're doing is, well, agribusiness is a derivative of the availability of energy-rich carbon, usually, mostly in the form of fossil fuels, and the aggregations of power that that highly dense carbon makes available. So, if we are to, I think there's a law, by the way, or a general rule. High energy destroys information of the cultural and biological variety and destroys the short loops, the short feedback loops within a system. Uh, I see the agribusiness as a derivative of coal, oil, and natural gas. That created, in a sense, the structure of the corporate state. Now, <clears throat> who will not be interested, for instance, in perennial polycultures or mixtures? Well, if they're perennials, the seed houses won't be interested. Uh, with perennial mixtures, you have species diversity, and with species diversity, you have chemical diversity, different kinds of plants. And chemical diversity means that it takes a tremendous enzyme system on the part of an insect or a pathogen to give you the epidemic. 
So the pesticide people won't be interested. And if within the mix we put the legume that does biological nitrogen fixation that runs on contemporary sunlight, the fertilizer people won't be interested. And with perennials coming up every year, the, the farm, there are fewer passes through the field. You have the harvest, yes, but the farm machinery people won't be interested. So seed houses, farm machinery people, pesticide people, fertilizer, all of those agribusinesses, the reward goes to the farmer and the landscape rather than the suppliers of inputs. Right now, the subsidies going into agriculture to the farmer, really the farmer is only laundering the subsidy to the suppliers of inputs. You know you got a farm crisis when the banks are in trouble. <laughs> That's how you know you got a farm crisis. So, I think that we don't have to battle those interests because the farmer just wants to make a profit and if it will be a compelling alternative with this reward going to the farmer and the landscape. This is the work for the younger generation. And, that, right. and to that point, um, and you've been talking about already in your last... About what? About natural systems agriculture. Yeah, I've been because talking about been uh, talking the conceptual about revolution. The conceptual yeah. revolution. Yeah. Do you want to can just, again, in a shorter, um, not a sound bite, but in a shorter paragraph, I would say, can you tell us what natural system, this is what you're yeah, talking what about, what natural, it is, yeah. what's its basic, basic principles, and how, um, in, um, how it's being disseminated across the, the industrial agricultural lands, and how are you getting other people to adopt yeah, what you're doing? Yeah, right. Okay. <clears throat> well, natural systems agriculture <clears throat> is, <clears throat> first of all, in the case that we're dealing with at the Land Institute, we start with the reality <clears throat> that we're primarily grass seed eaters and legume seed eaters secondarily. Um, and therefore, we're well positioned on the prairie, um, mid-continent, north, south, east, west. We're in the grassland, and so we have our library right there in the never plowed native prairie. And here's what is the story about a prairie. Whether we're talking about a Canadian province prairie, or a prairie east of Denver of short grass, or the prairies all the way into Ohio uh, that once existed, and few little patches yet. Those native prairies feature what we call four functional groups. Warm season grasses, cool season grasses, legumes, and members of the sunflower family. We're acknowledging, we start with the question of what was here. Our next question is, what will nature require of us here? And the third question is, what will nature help us do here? So on our prairie at the Land Institute, we have looked at the ratio of warm season to cool season to legume to sunflower family across our whole prairie area. Those ratios vary according to soils, according to humidity and whatnot. <clears throat> For instance, if you're in eastern Washington, there are a lot of cool season grasses. But if you're in Kansas, there are a lot of warm season grasses. All right, so the next thing is, let's think about the analogs of these functional groups in the domestic array. Wheat is a cool season grass. Corn and sorghum are warm season grasses. Soybean is a legume. And of course, sunflowers belong to the sunflower family. So what we're doing is perennializing the major crops, wheat, sorghum, sunflowers, corn, and domesticating some wild species. That the idea we put them together in a mix and create a domestic prairie, a domestic ecosystem, 
in which we then have brought the processes of the wild to the farm below ground in the soil with micromanagers that are elegant and processes above so that we can use contemporary sunlight for growing our food rather than to have to take the infusions of fossil fuel and have the experience of soil erosion. That's natural systems agriculture. Now, here's the downside of it. It takes a long time in plant breeding. We don't have anything available to go out the door. The Australians, however, have started to pick up on perennialization of wheat. There's a group of people at Washington State Pullman working on perennializing wheat. Um, and then we support some 20 graduate students around the country. We've had over 50 now uh, that are working on natural systems agriculture type research for their masters and PhDs. So what we're doing is infecting these students with the Land Institute virus with the hopes they can overcome the immune system of uh, the university and, uh, and get this paradigm, this conceptual revolution rolling. The, if you don't have the elements uh, that are soil sponsored that go into life, then the potential for uh, the plants the, uh, through photosynthesis to capture the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen, uh, and the nitrogen out of the atmospheric commons those four elements are in the atmospheric commons. That potential uh, is reduced. Uh, so imagine, say, the surface. And below here are these roots. Above here, the part available to the sun. And if the atmospheric carbon, the CO2, combining with water, H2O, in those, the sunlight capturing and uh, being captured by those green molecular traps called chlorophyll to get that carbon then allocated downward in the soil, the nutrients plus carbon are right up here in the top and it decreases as you go downward depending on the root length. So when this is eroded, now you got less carbon. That carbon which is so important in our bodies, that carbon stored in fungi, bacteria, earthworms, other creatures. That represents the workhorses that um, are turning these elements that will eventually end up in the plant that then we eat or that the cow eats or the sheep eats, or the chicken eats, um, as part of the great wheel of life. So if that's eroded, then we've lost some potential. Now, what we have done is come in with the fossil carbon and offset the consequences of that degradation. So what's happened worldwide is that the soils of the planet have been severely compromised. Um, 
There are various figures, and it depends on where it is, but well over 30% of the soils of the planet have been put into the category of, I think, serious degradation. Um, when we remove the fossil carbon that we're currently subsidizing and have to depend on the natural fertility of the soils to sustain us, with the agriculture that we currently have but without those fossil inputs, we will suddenly see what, we will unmask the compromised uh, reality, compromised uh, soils, and the overall production of food will decline. Um, besides natural systems agriculture, what other models of food production are admirable and should be reviewed or emulated? Yeah. Thinking, yeah. My good friends that are at work in the sustainable ag movement uh, that are not at work on what we call natural systems agriculture are working to be smarter with the crops that we have and are involved in crop rotations. For instance, you have some annual grain crop like wheat or corn or whatever that then may be followed by a legume like alfalfa or clover, some perennials that'll fix the nitrogen and so crop rotations uh, have been uh, employed, are being employed. These are practices that have been in existence for, you know, long periods of time in uh, agriculture. And a lot of these friends are trying to bring back and indeed are successful in bringing back, especially in the organic movement, uh, these crop rotations and taking measures to minimize the uh, soil erosion. <clears throat> it's what I call the smart resource management in agriculture and it's absolutely essential. Um, we're at work though in what we call nature's wisdom. We're looking to the way uh, rather than rely so much on smart resource management, the nature's wisdom approach in which we're trying to mimic um, the, the natural ecosystem. <clears throat> Agriculture involves what we might call a Sisyphus effort. Uh, you know, the, the, the myth of the steep hill and the rock. <laughs> Let's say that is a 45 degree angle and you got a big rock and you get behind the rock that keeps wanting to slip back. What we're hoping to do is lower that slope and decrease the size of that rock. We're never going to get that slope to zero. Uh, and we'll never get the rock to zero. But we, we can do better. But it's going to be a long time. I mean, it's going to, you're, we're looking in 15, or sorry, 25, 30, and even 50 year time frames before the natural systems agriculture will be farmer ready. So we must be using the best practices that are currently available. And also, I would say, um, you know, if we were to quit feeding livestock grains, we would have less soil erosion. Get the livestock to feeding on perennials, particularly grasses, uh, we'd have less soil erosion, we would have less meat to go through our system, we would have a reduction in cancer of the lower bowel, we would have any number of, <laughs> of uh, health problems go down and we wouldn't be putting these antibiotics into uh, the cattle and pig welfare program. Uh, so the main thing is to try to uh, 
eat lower on the food chain. Um, you know, we um, have cattle at our place, but they're grass-fed. That would, that's featuring the perennial system. Get rid of the feedlot. Get rid of what? The feedlot. Get rid of the feedlot and a whole bunch of problems would be solved. That ought to be, when the president gives a State of the Union message, uh, uh, he might say, my fellow Americans, I have directed the Secretary of Agriculture to take measures. We're not going to stop anything all at once, but we're going to start a tendency. And among those is to work toward the elimination of the feedlot uh, and the biggest welfare program in the history of the planet in terms of the biomass, the cattle and pig welfare program. How many people could you feed on grasses with, with pigs and cows? I mean, how much do you know how much? Oh, could be? we've estimated you could still get your uh, four ounces of um, meat protein, that sort of called minimum daily requirement, um, in the U.S. anyway. Um, with um, the grass-fed beef. They <clears throat> also, to move the dairies uh, to putting in, have more pastures and less grain. Uh, in fact, in the upper Midwest, uh, my daughter, who's a, uh, an ecologist working in conservation ecology, a professor at the University of Northern Iowa, she uh, has estimated that if we had as many dairies in the upper Midwest <clears throat> uh, now as we had in 1960, uh, that uh, we wouldn't have a dead zone. But those pastures that supported those dairies uh, have been plowed out and planted to corn and soybeans. Thank you for that. That's a great visual. Yeah, wonderful. That's really great. Do you want to say anything else about feedstock? Because we I didn't have anything in here on that. Do you want to on talk what? any more about livestock and? No. Okay. No, I, I Do you want to talk at all about GMOs? Well, like I can talk about GMOs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's been applied in a lot of what you said, but if we can yeah it. yeah, I hope I can explain why the GMOs are not uh, uh, not essential. Um. I don't know if I can illustrate this, but let's imagine, uh, you know, the normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve, imagine you were to fold that so that this would be the top, then it comes, so it's a folded Gaussian distribution. Okay, here's the bottom part, here is, and in here, what we're looking at is the genome of an organism whether it's a corn plant, or a human, or a redwood, or whatever. These are small effect genes right in here. And as you get down here, these are small effect genes. There aren't many small effect genes, but there are a lot of large effect genes. This represents sort of the genome as an ecosystem. Think of the genome as an ecosystem. What the gene splicer types are after are these large effect genes down here. And it's, if you move one of those from, say, one species into this particular genome, you now have this whole background that has to be in interaction with it. The price for doing that is it's very expensive and it's single gene the it's context dependency that we need to think about the context in which that gene finds itself some of my friends that are uh, also geneticists um, think that very soon the low-hanging fruit of the large effect genes will have been harvested. I also have been told that the venture capital is beginning to go away. 
Um, that long tradition of plant breeding in which you're forced in making a cross to bring all of these genes together, our very clumsiness is what saves us <laughs> in making the, um, uh, the necessary um, um, sort of stabilized situation. A friend of mine that worked for a major seed house, uh, a geneticist, said that some of these genes, when you put them in, they work for a while, but after a while, that's a, it's as though tar is smeared over them. In other words, what happens is this genetic background shifts and silences uh, that gene. So I just don't see that it has much promise, uh, not the promises that are currently being made. We will learn a lot about genomics. We'll learn a lot about how uh, the, the genome operates from all this work, but uh, I don't see that it's going to be any big cure uh, for uh, the food supply for humanity. My feeling is um, that there frequently there is um, the comment that we need to meet people where they are. Um, I'm tempted to put out a t-shirt that says we've got to quit meeting people where they are. Uh, because what we need to do is raise the bar. Imagine, say, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, some of the language that has come about in the dot-com world. Uh, that's language that wasn't there, uh, but <laughs> now people have picked up on it. We're talking about how important it is to understand the basic concepts that have to do with how the world works. And so it means an enlargement of the vocabulary. Uh, and we need to raise that bar on the vocabulary. Uh, so uh, if, if someone has problems with a word, all right, there are things called dictionaries that still work. And <clears throat> there's also a way to um, you know, to talk to somebody else about what he or she meant uh, by that word. But what has happened with the media, I think in particular, and the advertising industry generally, uh, is to dumb things down, and that makes it both simple and simplifying. Well, we need to get these subjects as complicated as they are. And people can do it. I mean, my gosh, there are people that have memorized all the lines of the Aeneid. And um, uh, people that have memorized the Talmud. There are, <laughs> we, our 1,350 cubic centimeter brains are capable of more than they're currently doing. Uh, so um, I, I think that we almost need a campaign uh, that says, let's try to understand <clears throat> the ecosphere, the ecosystems, the ecosystem processes, and let's get an understanding about how nutrient cycle and energy flows, and let's try to come together as a species uh, that devotes itself to the necessity of living on this planet uh, within our means instead of um, dumbly operating uh, as though we have a credit card and we never have to pay. Uh, <clears throat> well, I flew out here, and uh, <laughs> I've thought of another t-shirt, uh, a t-shirt that says, if we have to walk the talk, we'll never get there. Uh, uh, the, flu, the flight out here, I have to regard that as transition fuel to a sunshine future. Uh, but we ought to be at least acknowledging that when we are burning it up, that there's going to be some, some good, uh, some progress toward uh, having less of an impact uh, on, 
on the ecosphere. Um, so uh, that's two t-shirts now. If we have to walk the talk, we'll never get there. Uh, <clears throat> and um, we got to quit meeting people where they are. And then a third one, um, maybe we need to spend more time in discussion with the choir. Uh, people frequently say, you know, you're pre preaching to the choir. Well, let's not preach. Let's have a discussion in order to deepen the discussion. Because I think <clears throat> there's enough of a critical mass now that knows uh, <clears throat> that we've got a bad situation. So now let's get together and it's quite all right to feature questions that go beyond the available answers because what that's sure to do is to drive knowledge out of its categories. And that's our current problem. We've been unable to drive knowledge out of its categories. And, and, and featuring those questions that don't have an answer right away is going to create the kind of yeasty thought that will help bring on this necessary conceptual revolution. So you've been alluding to a lot of the, the, the what may happen in the future a little bit, and I'm going to reorganize some of these questions, but <coughs> what do you see um, happening with oil and how we're using it now? What are your fears and what are your hopes for that issue? Well, <clears throat> uh, we probably have about as much oil as we burned. <clears throat> <clears throat> and that's the bad news. Uh, because of, <clears throat> of global warming. Um, We've got to <clears throat> appreciate what by, I think, 2050, they're imagining um, almost a doubling in parts per million uh, from, say, 1800. <clears throat> and that doubling, uh, they recognize, uh, could raise the temperature somewhere between three and seven and a half degrees of the earth. <clears throat> and that three degree temperature rise translates into uh, the warmest the earth has been for two million years. Um, the consequences of that, we cannot know. They are at once not just unforeseen, but they are unforeseeable. <clears throat> uh, they won't be unforeseen. They'll be unforeseeable. So um, <clears throat> the quicker we can get off uh, the fossil fuel uh, diet, uh, the better we'll be. So the, the sub-question of what will happen to life on Earth if nothing changes is how can we build in feedback loops that will help us better adapt to truth? Okay. Well, the the... Key to adaptation is local. Uh, when the loop widens a long ways away from the farm, one loses the ability to keep track of the boundary of causation. Uh, let me explain that. We had a 10-year experiment at the Land Institute called the Sunshine Farm. 210 acres to be run on contemporary sunlight. The sunlight that fell on that farm uh, had to sponsor everything, including the energy costs for mining the ore in the Minnesota Iron Range to build the tractor the processing in Gary, Indiana, to the assembly, to the workers going to work to assemble the tractor, and so on. Uh, Marty Bender, the late Marty Bender, was in charge of that project. And um, one of the things that I think is the most important that we learned is that as Marty was trying to get an estimate of the embodied energy of a tractor or a one-pound bolt, or the embodied energy of the pickup truck that would go to town to buy the bolt, 
Um, and remember, the sunlight that fell on that 210 acres had to pay the full energy cost. We had, we had photovoltaic panels, we had draft horses, we had a biodiesel tractor, um, we had chickens, we had longhorn cattle, thinking they were the least fossil fuel dependent. But here's what ran ahead of everything else, is when that loop went away from the farm, the boundary of consideration necessary to overlap the boundary of causation became difficult. You can't keep track. So in thinking in terms of local adaptation, um, and this forces then us to think about coherent communities in which we get by on a sufficiency of people rather than a sufficiency of capital and have an information intensive system at the cultural level uh, is the way to then um, uh, not need uh, the heavy inputs from the fossil fuel. But as soon as we, you know, as soon as we, I can't stress this enough, the key, almost t-shirt necessity soundbite, the boundary of consideration should overlap the boundary of causation. And it becomes very difficult when you widen that loop away from the community and the farm. Why have some cultures been able to achieve ecological stasis while others haven't? Some cultures have had more slack than others. And those that have had the slack uh, have had the chance. I think uh, uh, Jared Diamond's um, uh, uh, talk about the um, Easter Island people. Uh, the number of options available to them was less than the number of options available to people in the, um, say, in the uh, Nile Valley. I'm also reminded of Barry Lopez's book, Arctic Dreams. And in that book, Barry Lopez tells about the, the mindscape of the native in Alaska. Uh, has to, the, the, the abstraction has to match the reality or you die. Um, the, it's what one would call a not a very forgiving environment. But say contrast that again to the Nile Valley or say the Indus Valley. There, there is slack. But I contend the reality is the same over if you discount time. It's a short period of time in the Arctic and maybe thousands of years in the Nile Valley. But ultimately, the abstraction has to uh, match the particular. And currently, uh, we are featuring abstractions that do not have the particularity that goes with it. And we all know that if um, you don't have a particular, uh, then the abstraction uh, has a way of, of just um, running. You know, uh, Blake saw that and Milton saw that. Um, uh, in a sense, the abstraction without the particular is the demonic. So um, it seems to me that the, uh, the civilizations that have managed to be successful, yes, they did have some foresight, but they also had the slack, maybe the time to figure it out. Uh, better, to stretch it out longer. Um, but in the Arctic, <laughs> uh, without oil, uh, in a sun-powered world, um, you better have it straight. <laughs> I, I think we uh, do have the ability to change. Um, I'm not, I'm hopeful, uh, and 
someone once said that optimism and pessimism are not arguments, but rather uh, um, uh, they're not opposites, but uh, the same surrender to simplicity. Um, I don't think we know enough to be optimistic, nor do we really know enough to be pessimistic. It's what we do, <laughs> you know, that's going to make the difference. And what I am seeing is an awful lot of young people that have the potential and the will to make this the finest moment in the history of Homo sapien. Because this, the young people, uh, are, are the ones that are going to have to figure it out, how to live within the ecosystems of the ecosphere in live within our means and stop the deficit spending or reduce the deficit spending to planet Earth. Uh, and I think the beginning, of course, has to do with where the break happened with nature in the first place with agriculture. That was what I think the Hebrews were dealing with in the biblical fall. I think it's also um, uh, uh, to a certain extent what the Greeks were trying to come to terms with in the Promethean uh, myth. Uh, so uh, I, I have what I call a false hypothesis, question mark. And that false hypothesis is this. Uh, since the Stone Age, there's not been a single technological product or process, including the domestication of crops and livestock, that has not come at the cost of the drawdown of the capital stock of the planet. Now, some might say, why do you want to offer such an utterly dismal uh, hypothesis? And remember, I said uh, false hypothesis, question mark. And what I'd like to do is read a small paragraph, if I might, from uh, Kathleen Rain the British poet. Um, Kathleen Rain was, uh, her patron was Prince Charles. And uh, Wendell Berry drew this to my attention. Um, uh, maybe you better stop that a minute. Oh, okay. That's Are you? Um, this is so like me. <laughs> We actually might be interviewing Prince Charles. You what? We might be interviewing Prince Charles. Oh, good. Yeah. Let's see. What did I... Is it running? We have a lot of tape. Okay. We may stop it eventually. This is just helping me. I kind of like the footage of you looking through your tape. You kind of like what? The footage of you looking through your tape. Okay, here we go. This is Kathleen Rain on T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. <clears throat> Eliot has shown us what the world is very apt to forget, that the statement of a terrible truth has a kind of healing power. And the terrible truth, if, if this hypothesis were true, it has a kind of healing power. In his stern vision of the hell that lies about us, there is a quality of grave consolation. In his statement of the worst, Eliot always implied the whole extent of the reality of which that worst is only one part. Now to me, the value is the healing power that comes from getting that it's not just global warming. It's not just fossil fuel dependency. It's not just soil erosion. It's not just chemical contamination of our land and water. It's not just the population problem. And it's not just all of those. The deterioration of the environment of, the, of our planet is an outward mirror of an inner condition. Uh, like inside, like outside. And that's a part of the great work. 
we have operated as though nature is to be subdued or ignored. And that break really became uh, important at the beginning of agriculture. And there's been a gain from it. And in that gain, uh, <clears throat> well, think of it this way. At the time of Copernicus, um, we had the carbon of the forests and the soils that made possible the slack we call civilization. And then came Galileo and Newton, still running on the carbon pools <coughs> of coal, of, uh, of uh, soil and forests. And then uh, that's the beginning of the Enlightenment. But we, at starting then, began to come to terms with the old religious questions. The old relig oldest religious question is, where do we come from? What kind of a thing are we? And the third one, what is to become of us? All right, well, we go through the Copernican Revolution. We come to the time of Darwin and our understanding of our biological origins. We then move on to, um, uh, you know, to Einstein. Uh, and to plate tectonics and how continents drift and so on. And then our understanding that we living things are the outgrowth of the metabolism of our galaxy. Uh, we now know that uh, the ancient atmospheres molded our metabolism. We know we're products of a dying star having been cycled twice. So we know of our origins in a stellar sense, we know of our origins as biological creatures. So where do we come from? What kind of thing are we? Now the big question is, for this generation, what's to become of us? And that'll depend on to what extent we embrace the ecosystem as the conceptual tool and repudiate the idea that nature's to be subdued or ignored, that our uh, future lies in seeking the answers to questions that and to create and to keep generating questions uh, on how to live within our means within this beautiful planet. So if we can then in a certain limited sense the expenditure of the pools of carbon that have given us this one species the chance to understand that we and we alone represent matter's way of having gained self-recognition in this part of the sidereal universe. I mean, that will have been a great thing <laughs> to have retained an understanding of where we are in the cosmos and on this particular planet which seems to be the only one within our solar system, or even the nearby uh, stars of our, uh, of, of, of our sun. So, but that, that will, I think of Aldo Leopold uh, and his monument to the pigeon. Um, and the dedication of that monument at Prairie de Chen. Uh, and he said that had it been, we are here to mourn the loss of the pigeon. Had it been the other way around, the pigeon would not have mourned us. And there shows our superiority to the other species, uh, not our technological <laughs> array. And so uh, I think that we, uh, we deserve to stay here but we're going to have to prove it. Okay, what stands in the way of change? Uh, well, I mentioned earlier that the capitalist model, we probably shouldn't beat up on ourselves too bad about that, except to acknowledge that it is what it is. Uh, it is our way of getting at the energy-rich carbon. And uh, the materials that it 
makes possible. Um, we've, we have a way to challenge that in a manner that um, I think uh, is rooted in the way nature's economy, nature's true economies have worked. Um, that tropical rainforest and the prairies and the deciduous forests and the alpine meadows uh, that feature material recycling and run on contemporary sunlight, those real economies, none of them have the abstractions that our economic system features. That doesn't mean that we can't derive abstractions. Um, that shows how energy flows through the various trophic levels and what the various potentials are. Uh, I don't think it needs to be uh, painful. It needs to have a lot of roll up our sleeves and think about uh, the rewards. But if we can begin to, first of all, focus on the local so that the loops that go away from our activity are short enough that we see the couplings. What has happened in the high fossil fuel era is a decoupling. Um, and so to get those couplings so that they're acknowledged. It also is going to mean that a lot of people have to talk and talk and talk and talk and disagree. But in the course of that talking and disagreeing, there will be clarification uh, for what represents a proper sort of political agenda. Uh, the political agenda will be a derivative of our understanding of uh, the nature of the only economies that have stood the test of time. Now think about how important this is for a moment. 65 million years ago, an asteroid smacked down in the Yucatan and wiped out uh, the dinosaurs, which made it possible then for the mammals to take off. And if it hadn't been for that asteroid, we wouldn't be here. But think of the biological information that was destroyed. But the only creative process at work on the world is with it processes are within those ecosystems, and those ecosystems eventually came back, relying on species diversity happened, the uh, uh, net primary production uh, increased again, and the diversity came back. Now, 65 million years is a long time. What I'm arguing is, is that the planet, given potential, given the potential, um, can recover. Uh, but what we've got to do is stop the process of the destruction of that uh, species diversity by trying, and one of the best ways to do that is through uh, trying to mimic some of the structure that's responsible for the various functions. So, um, uh, but I, I think that ecology and the politics and the social arrangements, the economic arrangements are all one. Here's the current problem as I see it. The science, technology, economic, pipe is this big around. It's this big around. And there's a gusher coming out. And the social and political institutions to receive that gush are this big around. If they were coming together, they could co-evolve. They could evolve together. But right now, they flood. So uh, the, there's a flooding of the science, technology, economic uh, uh, reality. So uh, to be able to slow it all down, <laughs> and after all, in a certain sense, all we got to do is figure out a way to stay amused while we live till we die cheap. Final questions. Yeah. So, do you believe it is our moral obligation to protect the planet? And if yes, how can we incorporate the action based on the morality that is concerned with the survival in the biosphere into political processes, education, and religion. Yeah. Well, um, 
I agree with Wendell Berry. Uh, I feel the same as he does. I don't much like religious talk, and I intend to avoid the subject as much as respect for it requires. Uh, but um, when we're talking about a gift, as he put it, how to receive and use a gift is, uh, is it puts it over into a religious uh, realm. And we've had the gift of life. We've had the gift of being able to live on this planet. And for us to trash it uh, is not showing proper respect for the gift. Uh, so, yes, uh, I think the conceptual revolution that I'm talking about is the only one in which there was a moral necessity. The other, other revolutions, we didn't need them. Uh, they had, so what if, the, if we think that the, earth, the, the, the sun goes around the earth? Uh, so what if we don't know the speed of light? Uh, so what if we don't know about continental drift? So what? So what? You know, you just go through. But we've got to understand how to live here. And that requires, I think, an understanding of the way the other economies have worked that have been here. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's moral. What do we owe future generations? Uh, well, I think we owe future generations the chance uh, to live in a healthful and productive uh, ecosphere and um, uh, that uh, we've enjoyed. I know that uh, as I have three children, six grandchildren, seven actually, and um, uh, even though I will never see field ready, the um, perennial polycultures producing grain in the fields, um, it doesn't take much because uh, to, to, to sustain the effort because it's an extension of love. And I think that we can find plenty of people uh, whose conceit it is uh, that they're willing to support and get behind something, the results of which they may not see in their lifetime. And that will be an important uh, psychological uh, um, it's a necessity and I but I'm finding there are people there uh, that uh, know that whatever it is that they are doing or they are supporting uh, it goes beyond <laughs> um, the, what they will see they will not see the finished work so that's the extension of love that um, I think uh, uh, our generation, your generation, um, has got to um, come to terms with. Let me, let me, the, the, it's just a time capsule message. So since we're at this very important moment in history, what are your heartfelt thoughts at this time that you would like to convey to them? Okay. Does that make sense? Um, I'm assuming that you are living in the year 2100 are at once the activists and the beneficiaries of a large population that made sacrifices unparalleled in the history of Homo sapien. Uh, these came at a cost. Lots of mistakes were made. Lots of fits and starts happened. Naivete was huge at the beginning of this journey, but we made it uh, we, we, if you are able to read this capsule, it'll be because 
a large number of people made it their priority uh, to solve the problem of how to quit depending so heavily on deficit spending of the Earth's capital. Uh, there will be, there will have been, if you are able to read this, uh, efforts by countless people who will remain anonymous to you. But it's your burden to take the torch and keep the faith and continue to build on the insights of this, the most conceptual revolution in the history of Homo sapiens. We have increased, we, if, for you to be there now, we will have increased the probability that we can more fully uh, deal with the question of what's to become of us over the next 100 years. When this journey was started, there was a lot of doubtful uncertainty that you would be able to read this. Well, there is something. One more thing I want to say, and you can decide to edit it out. Is it too late? No, we're rolling. Uh, Wendell Berry told this at our Prairie Festival one time. He told the story about a witty. A witty is somebody who uses a lost, lot less information. Well, a witty is somebody that's missing a shingle to, or two. And the witty's walking around town, and uh, he sees two men digging a hole. And he says, what are you digging the hole for? And one of them says, it's where we're going to bury all the sons of bitches. And the witty says, who's going to cover them up? And I think that's a way to acknowledge we're all in it together. <laughs> and that there is, there are, there are various degrees <laughs> of destruction in all of us. Uh, and that to presume there are good people and that there are bad people isn't a way to bring us together. Uh, Cause the, the question is, who's going to cover us up? And uh, what we're hoping is, is that there will be no need to. <laughs> so.